So when Spurs announced that they were going to be recording a documentary series with Amazon Prime, we thought there might be twists and turns. There might be a few injuries along the way. Mourinho came in to surprise everybody. But we did not know that we would be struck with the heartbreak of a dog dying. That is what we get in episode three to six of Spurs All or Nothing with thanks to Amazon Prime. That was just so unexpected, Willow Callan. Yeah, and it was like Jose Mourinho didn't really want to talk about it after he brought it up. It was like, I'm particularly sad because my dog of 13 years has died. And Harry Kane uh, tried to question him and Jose was kind of like, let's move on, move on. Um, yeah, it was uh, an unexpected emotional roller coaster in that episode. I think aside from that, you got it would seem that Deli Ali is the conversation maker within the dressing room is the thing I noticed, too. Last week, it was, you know, do you put toothpaste on before the water, water on the toothpaste afterwards, just water, then toothpaste. That was a compelling conversation this time around. What's your favorite chocolate bar? So obviously, Deli Ali is the guy when you're in the treatment room that keeps the banter levels up. Well, I do actually want to touch on that a little bit later on because all of the options I chose were wrong. But this is Team 33. I'm Enda Call. And as you uh, heard there, Willow Callahan is online with me, as is Colin Bowie, because we're looking at Spurs All or Nothing, the Amazon Prime documentary that's going out at the minute. Uh, if you want to text the show, text us on 53106 or you can tweet us at Team 33. That's all spelled out in words. And you can catch this episode back on our YouTube channel, Off the Ball, or on the OTB Podcast Network, available now on the OTB Sports app. We're looking at episodes three to six. Column, what were your thoughts on episodes uh, four, first of all? Um, my defining feeling from episode four and five and six is, how nice is Jose Mourinho? What's going on here? Where's the, um, where's the ruthless Machiavellian? Where's the egomaniac who's obsessed with winning? Um, the only time, like, for, you see the emotion with the dog dying, the Yorkshire Terrier, that, as, as Will says, he does not want to talk about, but he will repeatedly bring up, but he does not want to talk about it. Um, even after Spurs beat Southampton in an FA Cup fourth round replay, he says, if you scream a bit louder, you get tomorrow off. He's like a primary school teacher. He's like lovely. The only time I saw him upset was in episode six, which we'll get on to, but that's just the defining feeling for me in all six episodes. But um, I found with episode four to six that it actually, uh, I enjoyed each episode less as it went on. I enjoyed episode four the most and six the least. Yeah, definitely be inclined to agree with you there. Episode four starts off, it's Christmas time, the busiest schedule for the Premier League. And we're, uh, we, we get an insight into Spurs' Christmas party, which even still when I see people social gathering in large amounts of crowds, it still kind of gives me shivers down my spine because I'm like, what are they doing? But of course, this was before COVID. So you get to see Daniel Levy give one of the most cringeworthy Christmas speeches at the party. And to be honest, Will, Daniel Levy in these three, three episodes, you get to see him a lot more. And the more I see of him, the less I like him. Yeah, I can't help but think that Daniel Levy is playing up to the cameras. Surely this has to be a personality he's cultivated. Uh, there's a certain bang of Sunderland till I die from Daniel Levy's conversations with Jose Mourinho and like we saw that with the conversation he had with Christian Eriksen which again kind of makes you wonder if Christian Eriksen hadn't left the club would that conversation which was quite a lengthy scene have actually made it into the final cut because obviously they knew that Eriksen was gone at that point but Levy just comes across this guy is meant to be a ruthless businessman has got these David Brent-esque speeches and you know uh, little phrases that he uses and he's trying to come across as the nicest guy possible like he's doing everything possible to keep Christian Eriksen there while the tone in the background really is if we don't get 20 million quid you're going nowhere till the summer but yet he's trying to make it out as if he's his best friend and there's these kind of various different conversations that take place at Mourinho around the transfer dealings I kind of wonder how faithful that is to the reality like I can't imagine that Mourinho was as accepting of the situation given that he had an injury crisis as we continually have it brought up over these three episodes that he knows he's going into January he needs players uh, injuries and suspensions are racking up at this point and Mourinho seems like ah look Daniel whatever whatever you can get done is great I just get the impression that those are ex entirely staged conversations I'm sure we're going to talk about Daniel Rose in a lot more detail in a little bit but I can't help but think that they have very deliberately used the camera angles there to create a certain tone to that meeting whereby 
Mourinho is clearly shot at a different angle to Danny Rose, and it makes it look like Mourinho is looking either straight past him or at the ground when Danny is speaking. But I think that's actually a camera trick and a framing trick, and that Mourinho has actually been shot high into the left. So when he it looks like he's looking away to one side, I reckon he's actually looking straight back across to Danny Rose, who's sitting on a chair on the far side of his office. Yeah, and we'll, you know, we'll get... Oh, sorry, Colin, go ahead. Sorry, just very quickly. Do you know what I found really interesting about uh, episode four? is uh, in the, the aforementioned Daniel Levy speech, the Christmas time. Do you, do you remember what's on his Christmas list? Top uh, four and a, a trophy. trophy. Trophy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, that was, if that was The Simpsons, the next scene would be end of season, just head down and walking away to the distance. Or the, um, narrator, the narrator really should have just kicked in and said, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, but I also, this is the, the question I have, right? Is it impossible for a chief executive of a top-level football club not to be David Brent-like. Because Sunderland Till I Die is exactly the same as you've already said. It's See, exactly the same. And I, Spurs I, are successful compared to Sunderland. I want to say that Ed Woodward doesn't give me that impression, but he could just be the Michael Scott. And equally, he comes <laughs> off as as incompetent as Michael Scott at times when it comes to business, but everyone just assumes he's a good businessman. So I, I don't know, you could be, could be onto something there. Um, well, like I find it strange, lads, the fact that Daniel Levy seems to sit and have most of his meals at the club with yeah. the players and the staff. Yeah. Like, again, you would imagine that a chief executive would have a certain remove from that kind of group, but it seems mm. like he wants to be part of it. Now, maybe that's just purely because they're filming on match days or where they're about to travel or something like that. We never really get a timeline of when these conversations are taking place, but multiple times you've got Daniel Levy sitting in the same office watching Sky Sports and the continual loop with the players, which to me just seems a bit bizarre. Well, wh while we're on the topic of uh, Danny Rose and Daniel Levy, we may as well talk about the da Danny Rose situation in episode five, but... The the whole thing about Daniel Levy sitting in the staff canteen is an interesting one because Danny Rose, we are we're met with his frustration at the club. He wants to leave, he wants to get out, he wants to get some game time. And he is an open conversation about his future with Daniel Levy in the staff canteen in episode five about and Daniel Levy's explaining that, you know, Bournemouth might come in, Newcastle are also sort of interested, but there's no there doesn't seem to be any movement on the AC Milan front, which seems to be the one that Danny Rose wanted in the first place bit optimistic for a man of his uh, stature and age, but sure, look, AC Milan aren't the giant club that they used to be, so maybe he's right to be. But I, f I find that extremely weird, that he would have that sort of conversation out in the open in front of the other players. Within earshot of everybody, like there's two tables of people sitting down to eat their breakfast either side of them. And I know they've got microphones on, but that conversation wasn't hush-hush or it wasn't uh, a discreet conversation. It was literally Danny Rose going, so what's happening with Milan? Yeah, it was it was bizarre. And uh, he, he obviously, we, we know now he didn't get his move to Milan. He got the move to Newcastle. He's back at the club. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to know what's going yeah. on with Danny Rose at the minute. Very much so. I wonder, did he get wind that Ashley Young was going to Inter Milan? And he thought, well, there's, uh, there's a gap here for average fullbacks to, uh, to go to Milan. I don't know if he meant AC or Inter. Uh, but I mean, I, thought, I think Danny Rose, I really rate Danny Rose highly as a player. Um, and he does himself too, which is what comes through in, in episode five. Uh, but what I found really interesting was, I wouldn't say he was downright insubordinate, but this was clearly a man who had enough. And he was like, I can't take this anymore, being left out of the squad two days, two matches in a row. And the, the end of the rope seemed to be the Watford away game. And then he comes in to, you know, just to call Jose in. And, uh, you know, kind of a meeting there, boss. Jose, again, very, very obliging, very accommodating, absolutely no problem. What seems to be the problem? you know exactly what the problem is. Whoa, whoa. I was like, this is not going to end well for you, buddy. Are you, are you just, you're obviously gone in your head now because like he has to know, Josie. I mean, he has to come in there with a bit of subtlety and a bit of flattery. Like if you want to get on Mourinho's good side. Now, Rose, what I found really interesting and I noted it down, was just before they play that scene where Rose comes in and asks for the meeting, Rose himself says, I can be a difficult character to deal with. Um, and it's, it's funny how it's edited because the next scene you're like, well, there is example 101. That is, that is how to be difficult to your employer because he doesn't, um, there's no empathy really. There's just kind of like, why am I not playing? Play me. I want to play. And Mourinho's like, well, I mean, that's your opinion, but I'm the, I'm the manager, so I'm going to pick the side. 
And Rose is like, well, you know what? I'm going to talk to Daniel. I mean, he might as well have just not come back to the glove at that stage. Even though, even though when I watched it, I was thinking everyone's been there. Like everybody feels that disgruntlement, whether it's on your local football team, in work, in life, anywhere. Everybody feels that at some point, the position that Danny Rose was in. But um, like at 29 years of age, he's been, he's been in the game for so long. You would have thought, unless he really was at the end of his rope and he was like, I actually don't care anymore, that he would have attacked it with a bit more subtlety and being like, I understand why you're playing these other players. I just want to know, what can I do to get back into the team? Instead, it was, why are you not playing me? Everybody else is terrible. Yeah, it, I feel, was, I, it was like by far the best scene in the six episodes so far for me anyway. I, I feel like the people who say that they're a difficult character to deal with are sort of like the people who say that they're really funny. <laughs> is that like all they're doing is annoying people it's it's not uh, it's not a good thing that you're difficult to deal with it's it's quite awkward for everyone involved Colin, you're part of the management staff here in and off the ball in OTV sports oh. what would you oh, what God. would you say what would you say to me if i turned around to you and 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 give you the sort of attitude that Danny Rose give to Jose Mourinho in that situation because it's not as if this is a situ- I, I know it's slightly different because uh, it's a football team, but you're not going to get anywhere in life or make any friends or get any sort of favorable treatment by being that uh, being coming on that strong to your manager. Well, I would be to you. I'd say talk to JP because he's your manager. First <laughs> of all. It's nothing to do with me. Um, but I, as I was saying, I get I get where Danny Rose is coming from. But yeah, I mean, if someone said that to me. I, I would probably have the same reaction as Jose Mourinho. I would say, well, that's my opinion that's and I pick the team. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you're playing well enough to be in the team at the moment. And it's nothing personal. Um, whereas Rose is saying, uh, it is personal. What do you have against me? And like, I specifically remember an example where I was in the Rose situation. And I went to my manager like that. And it's one of like, my biggest regrets. And I think everybody has that because you become so obsessed with your own place in your work or your life that you kind of forget the perspective of anybody else. It, mm-hmm. Like, it is very relatable. I wouldn't be sticking the boot in roles, but obviously he's going to watch that and be like, oh, God, I don't come across well here at all. However, it's edited. As Will was saying, um, and Will, I think, texted into the WhatsApp group about this. He, he caught it straight away, which was Mourinho looking away the way it was, it was placed and the camera on him which makes it look like, you know, Mourinho doesn't even want to entertain Rose. So it looks really bad on Rose. And it's interesting, as you say, Enda, that he's back at the club now. The Newcastle loan is finished and it didn't turn into a permanent transfer. So I have a lot of sympathy for him. But in the, in the case of that scene, I would side with Mourinho completely. And I thought Mourinho dealt with him very well. Very well. Yeah, so if, if anybody hasn't seen it, first of all, spoiler, but I'm sure you have seen it. But it goes a little bit like this. Danny Rose is not happy with the situation. He's not playing enough. Uh, he, t- he tells Mourinho this. Mourinho explains to him that, you know, there are other, other players playing quite well right now. You didn't play well against Liverpool. When you did train well, you were playing. And then Danny Rose says, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right enough. Yeah, I didn't play well, but I, I only play once every three to four weeks. Do you expect me to play well when I'm only playing once every three or four weeks? And then he goes into a deep dive of his teammates who have been playing uh, really badly in training, really badly in games, and he can't see a reason why he's not starting ahead of them. I, first of all, would have thought that, God, he's going to regret that when he goes back into that Tottenham dressing room. But then there's a cutaway scene that's sh- quite short later on the, in, the, in the episode that Danny Rose is actually giving out to his teammates in the dressing room as well. So it's not, I, it doesn't seem that he has the greatest relationship with the, the teammates anyway. Not to kind of defend Danny Rose here, but we saw a bit of foreshadowing of this in the first three episodes too. You remember when the ball boy came in after the Champions League game against Olympiacos and Danny Rose throws the dirtiest look down the camera ever possible. And there's definitely like a few more kind of shots where he's kind of sulking in the background. It's very clear that he's unhappy. And like you can understand where he's coming from. He explains uh, to Cameron in a very short interview after the Mourinho piece that he's six months away from a European Championships, which we now know won't happen because of COVID-19. But he has to be worried about his place in the England squad because he's not playing. Also, he has to be acutely aware that Davies is coming back from that injury earlier in the season. And he's just about to come back into the team, who is the first choice left back. At the time when there's an injury, 
he's only playing, I think he said two games out of six, and there was a three-game gap between them. I remember that Liverpool game at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. They raided down Danny Rose's side on the counter-attack quite a bit. He had a very poor game that day. But as he explained himself, he's not getting into a rhythm of playing matches. Mourinho is playing non-natural left-backs at left-back ahead of him. And the thing is, players now have a ticking time bomb where they know that they've got a four-week window in which to move because of the transfer window. It's not like the days of old where you could say, right, I want to move in March or I want to move in October. You're stuck at a club outside of those transfer window periods. And I would imagine that Danny Rose's frustration is massively added to because he knows this is the last window where I can go and get regular football before the European Championships come round. And the fact that he is open to entertaining the idea of going to Bournemouth and Newcastle, I think shows his desperation to play. And to me, that's somewhat admirable that he doesn't sit on a big contract at Tottenham and just watch it out on the bench, that instead he actually cares about playing for his country and he cares about playing regular football. Yeah, look, I, I do see his side of the story. I think anybody who's played football will know the frustration of watching a team go out with a player who is in your position, who's not natural to that position. If you're center mid, sometimes you get a winger playing in there instead of you if you haven't been training properly or whatever like that. And it is extremely frustrating. So I definitely do see Danny Rose's uh, side of things, especially because it is Premier League level. This is elite level football. If you get annoyed at it because of your Sunday league team, then imagine how annoyed he is at a Premier League level. But the transfer deadline day and the transfer window does come into it quite a bit in episode five. But in episode four, one of the key themes is the injury list at Christmas time and how uh, gathered up the fixtures are at this point in time and how difficult it is on playing staff, on medical staff and on Tottenham's uh, staff in particular because of the amount of injuries they have. Harry Kane gets injured. Deli Ali is injured, Son is injured, uh, Lucas Moore is injured, Lamel is injured. He's, he, there, there was a point in time where Tottenham had about eight or nine starters that had some sort of knock or injury at this point in time. But Harry Kane's one is quite interesting because at the time you think, you know, Harry Kane, the reason this is such a big blow is because of the amount of goals he scores for Tottenham. But having watched episode one to three, you realise it's much more than that, that he is a leader in the team and having him out of it is actually a big blow column huge blow except there's far less cursing now pre-match uh, in the team talk with Hugo Lloris who uh, pretty much says exactly what Harry Kane was saying minus the curse words but with a um, French accent with a French yeah <laughs> that bit more charm yeah um, yeah he, Kane is a huge loss but he's still omnipresent in the documentary he's in the physio room I think in every episode he's from four to six he's he's present in some way I actually found it interesting when he's having a uh, the most mundane football chat with Ben Davies in the physio room talking about Peter Crouch and his stats. Yeah. I thought that was great because that's exactly what the rest of us talk about. Um, but in episode four, yeah, so Kane gets injured in the Southampton match on New Year's Day, I think. Um, it looks very innocuous and he, pulled, he, he does a really bad job in his hamstring. And what, but what I was um, taken by in, that, in those few scenes around that injury was you know, just how unglamorous professional football can be because... On Christmas Day, at 5 p.m. when it's dark, the players have to show up, leave their families and show up together. And then Ryan Sessignon, whose only contribution in the first six episodes so far is, it, is to say, we see each other more than we see our families. And there's kind of a, a despondent tone in that. Um, and then Musa Sissoko, I think on New Year's Eve, is on a, a video call with, I think it's his brother. Um, and... The rest of the Sissokos are away celebrating New Year's and he's in, you know, on his own in his, in his hotel room. Now, I know they have all the money in the world and they get to play football for a living and fame and all that, but that is the downside of it. Um, and you do then feel, you kind of feel sorry for Jose Mourinho because like, nobody loves an excuse more than Mourinho. But the list of injuries is outrageous, as you say, eight or nine first teamers. But with all those injuries comes the emergence of Jaffa Tanganga, and his fantastic story, uh, which we see in episode four about he's still living at home with his parents. And when he found out he was playing the Liverpool game, he cried in his room because he was um, so overcome with emotion and uh, presumably nerves. Um, and then when they lose that Liverpool game, just how delighted everybody is in the changing room afterwards about how well Tanganga played, which is so lovely. And also probably what Mourinho is alluding to throughout the whole series is you're too nice. Um, and I thought it was a really good insight. And Tanganga just comes across so well, as well as Son and Delhi did in the first three episodes. I think Tanganga is the star of the fourth. 
Yeah, he definitely is. Um, the episode four and the series as a whole so far really does a good job at uh, displaying how much of a commodity and how much of a cog and a massive wheel these players actually are when it comes to the fact that you know they can't actually leave their house because everybody wants to take a picture of, of them or the fact that uh, at Christmas time they they're really this the Christmas schedule is insane for the Premier League. It's it's mental the fact that this is the only league in Europe only major league in Europe anyway that continues throughout and actually increases throughout the Christmas period because there's there's absolutely no need for it if if the Bundesliga if the La Liga can figure out a way of getting a winter break in there then so can the Premier League and this is really driven by Sky Sports and the revenue that they can they can drive during this period when everyone's at home, everyone's watching TV, and everyone wants wants to see the football. I suppose it's, it's sort of an Americanized version of them playing uh, at uh, at Thanksgiving and throughout Christmas as well, and the NBA play on Christmas Day. So major leagues do do this, but they should be able to figure out a way of getting around us at this stage of the season. Disappointment for Irish fans, I think, for this episode four. I know Tanganga, I do agree with you. He absolutely is the star and maybe it is the fact that we live in a little bit of a bubble here in Ireland about Irish players get overly excited about them but the lack of Troy Parrott in these two episodes at least episode four and five is astounding because you're talking about three players they they talk about three players coming up from the academy to replace injured players Tanganga is one of them but Troy Parrott was also one of them and we didn't even get it we didn't even get to see the uh, the part where Mourinho hands him the ball they didn't even include that well, you did say that no Tottenham players can leave their house and unless you're Serge Aurier during lockdown to get two haircuts, not one, but two. Uh, but yeah, uh, Troy Parrott is interesting in terms of his absence. He has been in the background a couple of times uh, during the episode. I think before the FA Cup game, you've got the kind of tactical meeting and you can see Troy Parrott sitting down towards the back of the room. But yeah, it is very telling that, you know, you're getting the story of the Enfield boy and the guy who is still living two minutes away from the stadium and he's getting his chance to play. And you're thinking with all of these injuries, particularly when you see Harry Kane uh, twinge his hamstring and then you think maybe this is the moment for Troy Parrott because they have the call-up scene for the three lads not too long after that. You're thinking, I wonder how involved he's actually going to be in training and how much we're going to see him in here. But he continues to be a figure right on the fringes of everything at Tottenham. And maybe that's just a metaphor for what happened for Troy Parrott in the second half of the season because it's not going to be long. I think it's the next episode where uh, you get Sun Hyung min uh, falling and having his fracture. And at that point, you're thinking we're down to two players. It's Lucas Mora is the only real attacker that they have to play through the middle. He's more of a winger. Or you can play Dali Ali as a false nine. And unfortunately, we don't see any kind of hint whatsoever that Troy Parrott is going to be used, with the exception of seeing him on one shot on the bench uh, when they're in that game in Europe. Is it against Leipzig, I think, uh, where they show Troy Parrott on the bench, but you know he obviously doesn't get on. So it's kind of one of those things where you're like, and that was in February. So there's a bit of time kind of being condensed together here. But it's very clear that Troy Parrott doesn't get anywhere near the first team, or surely they would have used him in a similar story sense. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I think over here we were thinking... God, the Tottenham have no striker at all in their team at the minute. Surely this means Troy Parrott is on the fringes. Surely this means Mourinho is going to use him. But from the team meetings that we get an insight into, there doesn't seem to be an inkling that Troy Parrott is actually going to get a chance here. Look, maybe it's understandable that you know it's easier to throw a very physically developed defender into your defence than it is to put a gangly young player up front in a Premier League team. And maybe there's that to an extent. And I guess... Mourinho probably saw it that, look, Deli Ali can do a job there. Lucas Mora can come across if we need to. He changed the system ever so slightly to get the two of them into a more focal point position rather than putting Troy Park directly into the team. But it, like, it's definitely an insight into what Jose Mourinho is thinking. Also, in terms of your um, about the fixtures and the pileup around Christmas, I do think it was very nicely edited too where they put Jose Mourinho's comments after the game on St. Stephen's Day. And then he was saying, look, playing four games in nine days you know, physiologically, this is unfair on the players. An injury is going to happen. And then, snap, next game, Harry Kane is out for basically the rest of the season. Josie was also very kind of um, understanding of the news from the medical team. I actually thought when they arrived back and said that Harry Kane was going to be out for potentially up to 15 weeks, that you'd get Mourinho losing his cool. But he kind of went, right, OK, 
12 to 15 weeks. Okay. And there's another conversation where I think eight or nine players are listed that are injured before they're getting ready for their FA Cup game against Middlesbrough. And again, he's just accepting. He goes, right, we'll just go without those eight players then. Uh, I, I wonder if that's a, a camera reaction from Mourinho or is that genuinely how he actually reacts to the chief medical officer coming in and saying, you know, your star player, you're not going to have him for four months. Yeah, well, I think the situation with Harry Kane when he's out in the training pitch telling him that news, I think it's more of a reaction not to spook the other players because he's still he's in the middle of a training session. He doesn't want to do that. But also, I do, I do actually want to talk about his treatment to the medical staff because it's not all rosy, I don't think, throughout oh. this. Uh, especially in episode five and six, we get a, a little bit of a bite from Mourinho. But before we take a quick break, lads, what's your favorite chocolate bar? What's top three? Because they, they say dime. I'm, I'm not having dime anywhere near that. This is this is Deli Alley, by the way. If anybody hasn't seen Deli Alley, King of Shy Talk in the <laughs> Tottenham dressing room, ask the physios and the other players, what is their top three chocolate bars? Well, not a bounty was a good call. I'll give them that. I actually uh, don't mind bounty. It wouldn't be in my top three, but I don't mind them. Uh, it's about bounty's way down the ladder. Um, I think the old double decker before they changed the recipe would be right up there for me. That's like a meal in a bar. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, a star bar is right up there alongside the Galaxy cookie, cookie Crumble and maybe maybe throw in the old Wisp of Gold before they changed the recipe as well. I thought they were, they were, they were excellent stuff. Colm, you've gone quiet or else you've frozen. You can hear me, yeah. No, I was actually, I was, li- I was listening because it gave me time to think. Um, purple Snack, dairy, dairy Milk Gold and Crisp, Snickers. I think that's one of the worst top three lists I've ever heard. And I'll tell you but... what. Right? Well, the purple if snack we... is the king of biscuits here. Well, yeah, but it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a top and bar, though, isn't it? Ah, yeah, no, I, I think it, it goes it's into both Venn diagrams. Yeah, Venn diagram. And also, if we keep talking about this, we might get free chocolate. So um, we should probably elaborate on some sort of uh, starting 11 chocolate. Or what kind of a chocolate bar is Jose Mourinho? You know, well, no, if... Just keep mentioning dairy milk. If anybody in uh, Cadbury's or Galaxy or any other Nestle, if, if there's any other chocolate companies, I know there's a, there's a Dublin-based chocolate company, Tony's, I, I want to say. Uh, Tony Chocoloni, I think that's the name of it. If I'm, if I'm bastardizing that name, I apologize. But if you want to send in free chocolate, Team 33, address it to Marconi House. I will happily accept any free chocolate because I'm the only one working in the office right now. So it will all be for me and I will not post it out to the other lads. I do want to take a quick break. We will be back with the review of All or Nothing Spurs episode five and six just after these. Now, welcome back to Team 33 and a call here with you. We are talking about All or Nothing Spurs. Colin Buig and Willow Callahan are on the line. If you want to get involved in the conversation, text us on 53106 or tweet us at Team 33. Let us know what you thought of the opening six episodes of All or Nothing are for Spurs. You can look back at our review of the first three episodes on the Off The Ball YouTube channel now, or you can catch that as part of the OTB Podcast Network. Just search Team 33 in the OTB Sports app. Lads, transfer deadline day is the main theme in episode five. Christian Eriksen eventually leads the club, but not before we get a good insight into the sort of... I, I don't know if it was a stage meeting, but it was definitely a meeting between Christian Eriksen, Jose Mourinho, and Daniel Levy about what it takes to make a transfer and what is the stumbling blocks. And essentially it was, if we get 20 million for you, then we'll sell you, Christian. If we don't get that, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to stick around the club. Daniel Levy seemed a bit polite here, but I don't think that was actually his real thoughts. Well, Christian Eriksen comes across really well, lads. That's the one thing Mm, that stood out for me in probably even the three episodes where it's kind of continually in the background that Ericsson is looking for a move away. And I think when you see the conversation, you can understand it to a large extent. Chris Ericsson says, look, this was never about money. Like at one point, Daniel Levy says, if you've got a better offer from another club, we'll match it, which I think is interesting. It's not that Spurs are going to up his wages anyway for loyalty or having been a great player for the last five seasons. It's just, well, if you get a better offer, we're willing to go to that level. So to me, if I'm Christian Eriksen, that probably says a lot about my value, which is that you're only ever going to match what someone else is willing to give to me. You don't think that I'm worth more money now. And like reportedly Eriksen was only on the kind of 100,000 range when he was leaving Spurs, despite being one of their key players uh, for the last half a decade. And also, Ericsson said repeatedly, this isn't about money. I just want a fresh challenge at this point. 
you know, I've loved the club. I've given everything I possibly can. And Jose Mourinho, I think, reassures him that two or three times as well, where he says, look, if I put you out on the pitch, I 100% reckon that you're going to have full commitment. You've shown great commitment in training. I can only say good things about you. But Mourinho didn't seem, I don't know how you feel about this, column, entirely interested in trying to keep Christian Eriksen at the club. There was no big play from him. Because remember Daniel Levy said, I think, in episode two, it's like maybe you can have a conversation with Christian and see if he can extend the contract and sign a new deal. And Mourinho never really made a massive push to try and keep him. There's no, there's no push. Yeah, you're right. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if Christian Eriksen is a, a typical Jose Mourinho player. He's probably um, a bit tame personality-wise in Mourinho's eyes, even though I really like Christian Eriksen. I agree with you. I actually miss him when he leaves. I kind of miss his presence. He just seems, uh, he seems like a really nice guy and uh, a good to have around the dressing room is what we, the sense that we get from him. But I get the impression that Mourinho would, you know, any day of the week take the personality of a Harry Kane, not the footballer, the personality of a Harry Kane over the personality of a Christian Eriksen, who is quite passive. And I suppose Mourinho, um, Mourinho wants soldiers on the field for him. He, they want, he wants them to do battle for him. And maybe with Eriksen, even though he says, I, I believe that he'll give me 100% commitment, um, I think he's kind of like, you know, I'll use him if I have him available, but if I don't, it's not the end of the world. He kind of falls between the cracks because he's a good guy to have around the dressing room, but he's not a, a warrior in the sense that Mourinho sees a warrior, which is why um, for a, a number of games before Eriksson leaves the club, he starts on the bench. Mourinho's already planning without him. So, um, yeah, I did find it interesting that in that meeting with Eriksson and Levy that Mourinho is, um, for the majority of the time, observing what goes on. And then at the end, he gives us two cents about, you know, I really rate your commitment and I'm glad to have you around for now. If you go, so be it. But I think uh, Mourinho has kind of bigger fish to fry in his mind in terms of the players that actually want to stay at the club. So I kind of, I don't mind his stance on it, even though Ericsson is a fantastic player for Spurs. But even talking to Spurs fans that I know that watched him every single week, they were saying that Ericsson had kind of mentally checked out for the last 12 to 18 months anyway, even though he was still contributing massively on the pitch. I yeah. think from- from Mourinho's point of view, sorry, and just when it comes to his forward planning and maybe thinking about getting Ericsson out, I wonder if the conversation has happened with Danny Levy, which is we need the £20 million if you want to get Stephen Bergwijn in. And it's very clear when you look at the scouting reports, I think Mourinho mentioned it, that they've been tracking Bergwijn uh, since before that transfer window. The reason that they make the big push to try and sign him is it looks like some other clubs might get interested in the battle for him and Spurs go to try and make the move first. I wonder if that conversation may well have happened between the two, which is, I need this 20 million and Ericsson's wages off the books if we're going to get Bergwijn in. Mm. Yeah, well, th- I was just going to mention Bergwijn because he's the big signing for Spurs in, in the January transfer market. But you get a good insight while you were saying about what Mourinho wants on the pitch, what Mourinho wants when he's buying this sort of player. Uh, the things that he lists are he's a winner. He's already won trophies. He has uh, great potential because he's young. He can still improve. And he has a great family behind him and a good backing. So he's, he's a good character. He doesn't want any sort of assholes in his team. He wants someone who's going to be a little bit grounded when it comes to uh, coming into the side. And we see that Ver- Bergwijn's uh, family actually move over with him and move into the same house. So he's still developing as a man as well as a player. But one interesting part of this was that you actually get a player's thoughts on the tra- transfer market as well a little bit a little bit of eavesdropping on um a, a conversation between ben davies harry yeah. kane and christian erickson which was funny because christian yeah. erickson was moving uh, and basically chatting about how it's crazy that you know fans demand transfers every transfer window and that what whatever happened to letting players settle into clubs whatever happened to letting a player play him play his way back into form. And that's Ben Davies talking in this documentary, and that's sort of his, his thoughts on the matter. And it is quite interesting because that has come back into the conversa- conversation now. A, a lot of main transfer journalists or football journalists have been saying that fans have become too obsessed with transfers, that it's almost become a little table on itself, that it's almost you, you almost have a competition who can get the most players in now. And necessarily, that's not the way the football works and that's not the way the world works either. Yeah, we're all guilty of it as well, Ender. Like, 
people are already saying, are Liverpool potentially giving up ground to Chelsea by not being busy in this transfer window? Despite the fact that Liverpool had, probably over the last couple of years, the most consistent team performance in Europe. And they've just won the Premier League at a canter. They've racked up 90-odd points. Uh, they haven't really lost a huge amount other than Adam Lallana, who maybe they would like to replace. But Liverpool don't need major work. But for some reason, people think that Chelsea are doing things entirely right because Chelsea are looking to bring in half a dozen players and are spending a quarter of a billion pounds in doing so. And yet Liverpool, who are going to rely on the core group that they have and the coaching that they have under Jurgen Klopp, are seen as either staying standing still or going backwards just purely because they're not doing business. Like I would imagine Jurgen Klopp would probably look at things and say, hey, it's a pandemic. It's probably not a great time for Liverpool to be spending anyway. And I already have a core group of players here who've shown what they can do over the last two seasons. Uh, we've got, what, 196 points over the last couple of years. So therefore, I have no great need to reinvest hugely. But yet, for some reason, as fans, we assume when business is being done that a club is being progressive. I get well, the impression... Sorry, I get the impression that um, the only people who enjoy transfers are those not directly involved in professional football. And everybody within the game actually hates transfers. Um, because as Will says, fans are just obsessed with them. I mean, take a cursory glance on Off The Ball's YouTube page and see the highest viewed videos. A lot of them are to do with Manchester United transfer gossip because people are obsessed with it. And like, I can think of two examples at the top of my head is that when Rovers, when they won the Premier League in 1995, they didn't strengthen in the summer and fans were worried about what would happen. And subsequently they fell away and four years later they got relegated. And then Manchester United on the back of winning the Premier League three years in a row bought Juan Sebastian Varane and Ruud van Nistelrooy to the club and didn't win the league again for another two years. So you can go both ways and I just think fans get restless if players aren't coming in. But what I did find the most interesting about that conversation ended that you mentioned is that Ericsson stays very quiet when Ben Davies and Harry Kane are talking about why, why are people so obsessed with moving in January? <laughs> Eric just keeps his head down and keeps it eating. Yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, one of those kind of interesting insights that we get to the the mindset of the players. But yeah, like uh, Tottenham are probably the prime example of a club that showed that by bringing in six players in a transfer window doesn't necessarily mean yeah. you're going to be successful. Do you remember the summer they sold Gareth Bale yeah. and they brought in six players that are exactly the same? It was like. Christian Eriksen, who, who was successful, yeah. I think they brought Lamella in in that transfer yeah, window as well, yeah. it was pretty good. But Chadley. they did also bring in Chadley and a couple of others that fell away Soldado, from the wayside. Saldado, who was a waste. Saldado. Yeah, yeah they, they spent the all of the bill money at once. And it didn't work out for the better. It actually took a couple of years before they started to build the squad over a long period of time. And that's probably what the better strategy is. Chelsea have t- taken the other option. We'll see if that works out next year. But transfers don't always work out. And that's just the... The, the end to it. Um, but uh, leaving the transfers behind, we mentioned before that there are a lot of injuries focused in these uh, episodes. Hurricanes out, Son does have an injury, and that's the one I want to focus on. He gets a knock on his wrist his, or his elbow, and it's a lot worse than they, they thought it was. He played the rest of the game, so Mourinho assumes he's fine, but it turns out it's a fracture and he's going to be out for a couple of weeks. And this up until this point, it's all niceties with Jose Mourinho. It's Mr. Nice Guy talking about how family, courage, bravery, that's all the, the key components to life and to football and the treatment of Danny Rose, the meetings with Deli Ali and Harry Kane. They're all It's all good up until this point. But this is where you see the sort of nasty side of Jose Mourinho when he has a, he- a, a head-to-head with the chief medical officer about Son saying, he needs to play. I don't care. If he if he says he doesn't want a scan, then he doesn't get a scan. Don't give him a scan. I need him next week. And that's really just... it. It's not the chief medical's fault that Son is injured. Mm. Yeah. I, I thought that was really... I thought second to the Danny Rose scene, that was the best scene for me in the whole documentary because that's the Jose Mourinho. Isis is more like him than the one who's very camera aware and is very charming and likable. And you understand why the players would do anything for him. But that's the nasty side. So, yeah, Jeff Scott, the head of medicine and sports science at the club, as you say, Enda, he's just doing his job and he's trying to look out for the welfare of the player. And what I found really interesting is that Mourinho doesn't even make eye contact with him. You know, they're talking about the Danny Rose angle and that it look like Mourinho's looking away from Rose when he's not. But he certainly is with Jeff Scott, the head of medicine and sports science. He want to entertain this conversation. Now, that's probably a snapshot into what every medical team 
has to deal with when they deliver the news like that to the manager of the team because it's the last thing the manager wants to hear. And then you have Hugo Lloris telling the staff, I understand his frustration because any time we go on any sort of a run at all, somebody else key gets injured. But um, I did, I, I really found it uh, intriguing, um, Mourinho's denial that Son was injured and he has to play, he has to play and walks away. And if you're in the position of the medical staff, you're like, what more does he want me to do here? I'm telling him the truth and he doesn't want to hear the truth. Um, I thought that was really, really good insight. And it shows the difficulty of these guys' jobs. Yeah, and it's famously reported about the treatment of Eva Canero from his Chelsea days. So this wasn't all that surprising for me, but it does show you that it is important that these medical professionals in the game and at the clubs are basing their opinion not based on what the club needs, but what the player needs. Because too many times in the past, especially with the likes of head injuries and concussions, when there is not uh, an objective medical officer working within the realms of their their job, then long-term uh, repercussions happen. And that's what, this, that's what uh, these Tottenham medical staff are trying to do here, essentially. They don't want Son to go out and for something to happen to his arm that eventually comes back to haunt him with. Yeah, and look, it shows the dangers too. And like concussion is obviously on the really dangerous end of things. But we even see with Coco Lamella in, I think it's in episode five, where he rushes back to try and be fit at a time when they need attacking players back. He goes out and he overdoes it on the training pitch and he hurts his thigh and his groin on the back of, I think, of an injury that was further down his leg. So it's like he doesn't quite, he's not quite back to where he should be going at 100%. He's trying to impress his new manager. He's trying to get back into the team. And then he gets re-injured and he's back out for a spell again. I guess in terms of the frustration with the son injury, it's that I'm guessing Mourinho sees that as a mitigating factor in terms of, right, we don't have Harry Kane, but we can just move son across and we can play Dali Ali over on the other side. And even if it means that these players have to play every game, I've still got a top quality attacker who can continue to play through the middle. And then it just doubles down when you realise... First of all, that son is out. And then when he gets the news from the medical officer that the injury is more serious than first suspected and that Sun Hyung Min could actually be out for a lengthy period of time, I think that's when you then see things boil over. I also get the impression, I don't know how you feel about this, lads, that maybe Mourinho thought that the medical staff were a little bit soft in a few of the exchanges before that. Do you remember the one where they're reading out the list of players who aren't involved or won't be able to train? I kind of got the impression that Mourinho was like, right these guys aren't willing to actually suck it up and play through the pain well obviously the medical officer is just trying to do everything possible to ensure these injuries don't go for a longer period of time but I, I get the impression that Mourinho has that feeling that you should be willing to pay play through a certain amount of pain didn't he say that at Manchester United about someone too was it Eric Bailly maybe where he said that he wasn't willing to play through what some players would be willing to do yeah I, th I can't remember what player it was but he did say that they need to play through the pain barrier that there is a, there's a threshold that some players can't get past in terms of pain, that some players would consider it a knock and then other players just aren't willing to risk it. And he sort of alludes to that with Christian Eriksen as well when he's talking about his transfer move, that, you know, I, I know that you're 100% committed, but, you know, maybe you're not because you don't want to get injured because uh, you don't want to scupper your mood or your move away from the club. And that that's sort of a theme. And... To an extent, I do get where he's coming from. If it's a knock, then players probably should play through the pain. Uh, but if it's a muscle tear or a muscle injury, you can't really play through that pain because you're ult ultimately only going to make it worse. The Sun situation, I think he's frustrated with the fact that, well, he does have all these players out injured and Sun, whose arm doesn't really affect his play, and he, he does mention that he had this injury before and he just strapped it up in a cast and that was fine. But that was back in his day when, you know, the medical science wasn't exactly what it is now. So I do see his frustration, but ultimately he takes it out in the wrong people. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll as a point there that Mourinho views that of course they do seem that there's a, there's a certain level of trepidation in their voice when they deliver this news to him because they know he's not going to like it. Um, and I guess uh, Mourinho probably feels he can to a certain extent walk all over these people because they're not going out for the pitch for him. Whereas he is much kinder to the players because he needs them playing for him. The Son um, injury, 
I think really frustrates him because Son has just scored two goals the day before away to Aston, including a last minute winner. And in the absence of Harry Kane, he's their biggest threat. And as I say already, Mourinho is um, just not willing to accept that a player with an arm injury who uses his feet to play can't play for, um, for the, the upcoming games. And he, do, he takes it out on the easy targets, I think. But at the same time, that's being um, quite judgmental in terms of human nature because you're angry in those situations and you are probably going to take your anger out on the wrong people. It is going to be misdirected. And the reason I like that scene is because we actually do see the vulnerable and human side of Mourinho, which is what I would like to see more of. I mean, I would love to watch a documentary uh, about Jose Mourinho during his time at Porto or the first spell at Chelsea or Inter Milan or even Real Madrid when it all fell apart. Many people say he hasn't been the same since. Um, This is probably the most sanitised version of Mourinho, but you get a little glimpse into the flawed nature of him. And I don't mean that as a negative way. I mean, everybody's flawed. And that's what you see more of in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And we probably will see more of that coming forward in the next couple of episodes where we get the eventuality of COVID, which we all know scuppers the season. And Tottenham's season doesn't work out quite as Daniel Levy expected for his Christmas list. But we do have to take a quick break. Back after these. 